Hey everybody, my name is Aaron Canole and welcome back once again to another edition of the Movie Battleground. And tonight, uh, following us kicking off the tournament last week, and if you did not check out what was a really competitive match between Medea Raymond and Ryan Payne, go check that out when you're done here. Uh, but we kicked off the tournament last week, and while you'll have more of that coming later this week, we also have an entire rest of the roster that isn't participating in the tournament, and we're kind of at that point of the season where we're starting to wrap up. Everybody's sort of getting their final matches in, and to a lot of people, how they end is just as important as how they started. And tonight we have two competitors who, of course, are looking for that positive win. Uh, Ross Bristow is a competitor who's had two very good performances to start his career out in the battleground. Uh, just availability gaps in between have lessened his ability to play, in addition to uh, also the fact that he hasn't unfortunately been able to turn those into a win yet. So, of course, ending on a win would be a big, big step for him. Against him, we have Malcolm Lay, a longstanding competitor of the Battleground, who's more than made it clear that win or lose, he's just here to have some fun and talk some movies. But, I mean, again, as I say every time with any competitor who finds himself in a little bit of a rut like that, a win is a win. And it'll feel good any time that it comes. So we'll see what the game shakes out tonight. That said, we're going to bring in our first competitor. Coming in with a record of one win, six defeats. He is Malcolm Lay. Malcolm, welcome back, sir. How are we feeling tonight? Or today, given the sunlight. <laughs> I'm feeling good. I'm just going to just refer to the moment. But I'm here. I wasn't going to delay, delay this anymore. <laughs> but yeah. Well, you're you're a soldier for fighting through. That's a that's probably the worst thing that could possibly feel bad uh, when it comes to a debate match. But uh, we'll we'll get you through it. We'll see how it goes. I mean, this is at any point like you know, personality part aside. If at any point you need water, just let me know. We can take a pause. But uh, with that said, man, uh, yeah, of course, you know, you're coming in tonight. Uh, you have a very casual attitude about all of this, but I'm sure a win would still feel nice. How do you feel about your odds tonight? Um, I'm. Honestly, feeling relatively um, confident. Um, there is one question, admittedly, I stuffed up when picking, but um, it is what it is. I'm not going to say it now. I'll probably say it after that. The question has happened. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. All right. We're going to go ahead and sit you in the back, sir, and bring in your opponent. Coming in with a record of zero wins, two defeats, he is... Ross Bristow. Ross, welcome back, sir. And again, as I said, uh, both performances this year have been really, really good. Uh, you've had some strong performances. You just haven't quite been able to snag the win in a couple of close matches there. How are you feeling coming into round three? Uh, since it's been so long, okay, but I hope I can actually like turn this into a win because like, you know, like I like the categories I picked. So yeah, you know, just hopefully I can, you know, I actually came a little bit prepared this time. So yeah, you know, yep. So uh, yeah. Hey, absolutely. A a every single time I feel like people play, they get a little, little slightly bit more confident, a little bit more prepared sometimes, uh, and every little bit helps. Uh, and they, I mean, they, I have so many people come into this being like, yeah, man, I want to win, but like, fuck the questions. It's at least nice to hear that somebody's confident in something they've picked. You know what? Let's take the positivity where it comes. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and bring your opponent in. Guys, Go ahead and get it started. Movie Battleground is a game that is a best of five rounds. It is a first of three points wins the match. Each round of debate is worth one point. If a competitor picks up the first three wins in a row, that will be a victory by knockout. If it is a two to two tie at the end of five rounds, we do have a blind round question ready to go for you. Uh, but we shall see if we have to use it. Uh, with that said, in terms of the four questions, these guys have had them. They've had their time to prep. They will get 60 seconds to open the argument, followed by a two minute solo speaking period each to expand their arguments. Four minute open debate where they'll trade back and forth and try and get some points in on each other, and then a 60 second closing argument to end off the round. I have three judges backstage in the form of Jake, Nick, and Alan. They will join us on screen at the end of each debate, and based on the arguments you guys have made, we'll determine a winner. With that said, we're ready to go. Yep. 
All right. So we'll go ahead and jump into the first question tonight, which is a viewer submitted question. Uh, this was sent into us by somebody from the community. And it is, uh, I mean, honestly, throughout the history of film, there are certainly genres of film that you can assign a decade to, right? Westerns were huge in the 60s. The 70s had a lot of political thrillers. Every decade feels like it brings a genre with it that really, really gets rolling. Uh, comedies like the, 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 uh, like the real just crazy comedies in the 2000s. And in the 90s, I think you could argue disaster films is one of those. So many disaster films came out in the 90s uh, that weren't actually disasters, because that was the thing for a long time. It felt like all disaster films became disasters like just before they were even released. So as submitted by Austin Howe, the question is, what is the best disaster film of the 1990s? Uh, and we got two of the all-timers here, so let's see who wins out. Behind the scenes, Ross, uh, Ross, you were the competitor who was deemed the favorite based on records. You had the choice of which questions to go first on. You picked to go first on one and three. Malcolm, you're going to go first on two, four. So, Ross, I'm going to go ahead and throw you the timer. Of course, wish you guys a customary best of luck on the matchup. And, Ross, your one minute will begin when you start. Okay. I'm going to go with not only the best disaster movie of the 90s. Some people would say it is literally the best movie of the 90s, and that is Titanic. I know that some people are saying, like, oh, it's not a disaster movie. There's literal people running for their lives as water comes in. And then, like, you know, like, it, it has, it has like, everything. that's like, action and romance. And then, like, you know, like, a little bit of horror, you know, you, you know, like, when, when the gut, when the, uh, when the, when the, um, smokestack falls on the guy and then uh, like when the guy guy gets sucked in in uh, like with the whole you know like when the ship ship breaks apart so yes i'm gonna go with tight titanic is because like it is it is it has every single genre in it even a little bit of fantasy at the end so yes titanic is not only the best disaster movie of the 90s it is the best movie of the 90s and time all right, Malcolm, over to you. What's your pick? Um, yeah, so um, the I, I went with um, with arguably one of Michael Bay's better movies. I went with Armageddon. It's the it's one of those disaster movies which is just really fun. Like you've got people like Owen Wilson, um, Bruce Willis, Billy Bob Thornton, Liv Tyler, Ben Affleck, all in here, um, and it's just a really fun disaster movie um and it's just one of those ones that like yeah you've got um and then you've got like a crew that that go down space to try and stop it it's just it's got everything you ever want in a disaster movie just a lot of fun and a lot of disaster i yield the rest of my time gotcha all right didn't want to just immediately cut you off there uh all right so it is going to be Armageddon versus Titanic here in the first round. Ross, you're back up for your two minutes, sir. The timer will start back up when you begin speaking. Okay. When you say that, you know, like it's one of Michael Bay's better movies, you are right. But you cannot polish a turd and say that turd is a better, is a good movie. It's not. It is, it is, it's like entertaining. And yes, there's some disastrous parts. But though, you know, like, um, but, but now, like, you know, like, like yours is actually like, I find, I find like the second half of yours a little bit boring. And then like, you know, like I do, you know, like while Titanic, you know, like, like is ep is, is just like straight, like epic throughout. And then the disaster scenes are actually more scary in my film. I think it's because your film did not happen. Mine actually did. They actually have proof, proof that like people died with the smokestack and getting like su sucked in when it went when the ship broke in half. So like, which one is more scary? You really think, reality or fantasy? And then like you know like my film, your film, I think won a few Razzies too. And like my film literally won, won, won the uh, won like Oscars and not just for visual effects. My film, I think. Yeah, it's it's tied 
for the most Oscar wins in history. Name name me any other disaster movie that has won best picture, best director. How many? I don't see Armageddon doing that. So yes, I yield my time. Sorry about that. Lost audio for a second there. I'm assuming that's a yield of time? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, all right. So we're going to go over to you, Malcolm, for yours when you are ready. Um, yes. Yeah, so, like, well, yes, Titanic won a lot of awards. But winning a lot of awards does not necessarily mean a movie is the better. It just means the majority of the Academy like the movie. It doesn't. But... Um, and for the most part of Titanic, like, um, there's you, people do argue that that is for the most part is really boring too. Like, they push the, most of the disasters, mostly the background thing to the whole romance element between Jack and Kate, uh, Jack and Rose. So, um, and yeah, I mean, well, yes. It really happened. No one is ever trying to dispute that it didn't happen. Um, but just because it happened in real life does not make it the better movie. Um, and just because of my arm um, again has been nominated for Razzies, it does not make it the worst movie. Um, it's just Arm um, again is just one of those really fun movies and the, like the disaster um, part of it is really scary and also like it's more fun seeing people trying to stop the disaster from causing more damage later on so it's one of those ones that I think for those reasons I think that's what makes it the better disaster movie in my opinion I yield the rest of my time all right we'll go ahead and jump over to the four minute open discussion segment uh as always i like to ask the players be sure not to step over each other's toes too much do give your opponent a chance to speak while you are still vying for your points there's a rhythm to find there and i'm sure you guys will that said the four minutes will start back up when the first competitor speaks okay how you say that you know you don't know like you know like um it's the academy if you if if it was just the academy, then how come how come does it how how come how come like was it the is it the third most successful film of all time? Wait, second or th wait no fourth fourth sorry sorry I, I yield that you know it's because you know you know like Cam Cameron basically has a top five but 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 still you know you know like and then and like yours yes it's fun and then and like you you could argue about about mine but like. Your love story, you know, like in the your love, you know, you know, you know, like mine still is still like if you were to like if you if we're just be a disaster movie, it would work. Your film also has a romance. If you were to take that out, you know, doesn't work. So yeah, you know, you know, like and then like you know, like yes, your film is fun, but but now like my my film is still revered by the public. You know, like if they didn't, I didn't see I didn't see you know um, Armageddon having its uh, like like a uh, 25th anniversary screenings titanic just had this 25th anniversary screening so yeah if it you know like so yes and then and then like you know like like your film has good special effects mine has groundbreaking and then the key to a good disaster movie is the story with the effects your film just has the effects my film my, my film has a story with the effects Armageddon definitely has a story. Like, um, it's basically about people trying to prevent disaster. Look, that is the story, and it's like, and just because um, um Titanic, your movie made um a lot of money, does not like making money does not necessarily mean like good movie. Um, it's what it's 
just means a lot of people went to see it at the cinemas and it was at the cinemas for a long period of time um so i mean it's just that it's one of the but as i said um with um the actual disaster of the movie it was put for the most part put into the background and they focus more on the romance between jack and rose and it's and to me that's why i think it appealed more to the academy because the academy like likes their dramas and stuff at the oscars not so much like other genres yeah but still you know like i i said too like it it it, it, it is remembered fondly like you know like what like and then and then like you know like your film is it okay your film has a story but the storyline isn't the most important thing and then they'll like like and then and like i think with most people you know like storyline is the most important while while yours is a good movie mine is an amazing movie and then and then like you like people watch it everything because like they they look forward to to the disaster scenes too you know you know you know like people walk out going that was a great movie while yours people go that was fun but then it was forgotten except for a a small niche i mean i can count on one hand the amount of times i've had conversations with people about titanic i've had multiple conversations with people about i mean people still remember armageddon i s constantly talk to people about it um and yeah i mean it disaster isn't even the most important part of your movie either <laughs> like it's literally in the background like the important part is the romance story and time all right, we're going to go into the one-minute closing. Ross, you are up first, so the timer will start back up for you when you're ready. Yeah, but when people now, like, talk about, you know, you know, like, the best, they're not talking about, you know, like, one aspect of the movie. A good movie is is everything that combines it all. Your film, yes, yes, and, like, my film, though, you know, like, you know, you know, you know, like, like, disaster is in the background, but it's still an important part part and then and then like you know like the story the acting my film does like everything just better you know you know not like how they recreate the ship in the movie while your film you know like yeah there were the cool cool you know you know there's a few cool shots but then like you know like you if you were to put your film on mute people would be people would get it my film you know like actually requires some some thought to it so yeah so like i think the best film is, is the one that combines every element of filmmaking my film does it and time all right and then malcolm back over to you for the final minute of the round i mean if you just wanted to see a movie about the titanic seeking you could put titanic on mute and um and watch it and you'll still understand like oh the ship in iceberg the ship sunk um so um but it's with armageddon the disaster is the most important part of the story because it's about the disaster happening then it's about this group of te people going into space to destroy the um asteroid to prevent any further disaster happening um and um that is the most important part of the story like the disaster is in the background of titanic but and the most important story is is the relationship between jack and rose so i mean it's the question is about the best disaster movie like well titanic is a good drama movie with the disaster in the background mine's a good disaster movie and time all right we're gonna go ahead and sit you guys in the back and bring the judges forward here for the decision all right uh jake we're gonna go up to you first as you're wrapping up there uh when you're ready tell me who gets your vote and what was the main selling point uh ross got it done here for me throwing out the blend of 
filmmaking, um, Oscars gross while not everything are viewed it is the story, the acting. Ross. All right. So the first book goes to Ross. Alan, down to you, sir. Same question. Um, I really liked both of their arguments for you know defending their movies um, and good points attacking each other's uh, movie as well. And I never thought I'd ever say this, but Ross convinced me that Titanic is the better movie. Um, so I went with uh, went with Ross as well. I just think he, I, I really like that we talk about the legacy aspect of Titanic. You know, it's, it's a lot more well known. Um, it sticks with people longer, um, even though Armageddon's more fun. Um, I think uh, he really caught the legacy of Titanic and, and how that was important. So Ross is mine. All right. With that said, judges, I'm going to go ahead and put you guys in the back, and then we'll go ahead and move on to question number two here. Yeah, that's the question I stuffed up in picking, because I picked first, um, and I didn't figure Titanic, so that's on me. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and jump into question number two here. Give me one second, guys. What's up, Nick? I did see you. I just had to get to a natural point where I could edit it to stop for a conversation. What's up? Sorry, I just wanted to point out I was I was hoping for a uh, Celine Dion versus Aerosmith kind of conversation. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, they both do have songs, don't they? Okay, all right. Yeah. <sighs> You know what, fuck it. I'm going to leave that in. Let's go ahead and go into question number two. That's not worth going back to edit. Question number two, uh, we're going to go into... It's funny that you guys spent, uh, obviously, Titanic, big award winner. It's funny you guys spent uh, a good bit of time there talking about, you know, the awards and the legitimacy of awards and legacy and things like that when, when compared to a best film. Because awards are all that matter for this next question. Uh, the question is, which of the award wins at the 2007, I, it just says awards, but obviously in this show, we only really focus on the Academy Awards. Uh, if somebody ever wants to do a deep dive into the SAG after awards one year, I mean, I'd be my guess to try and pitch that, but that's real technical. Uh, which of the award wins at the 2007 Academy Awards, which is 2006 films, People watching, comment below. Is this the most concise way to write this? Because nobody seems to agree on how I should word these questions. Uh, but anyways, uh, was most worthy of the win. Um, I feel like when it comes to Oscars and when we talk about the validity of nominations and wins, most people focus more on what got snubbed rather than what won. So let's talk about genuinely what was the most deserving award. Now keep in mind uh, for the judges at home, the competitors are arguing one specific award win. So even if their film won multiple awards at the Academy Awards, they are focusing their argument on a specific award. Uh, but with that said, we'll go ahead and jump into this. Malcolm, you are up first on this question. So I'm going to go ahead and throw it over to you, sir, with the timer. When you're ready, you can begin. Um, yeah, so for me, um, the most deserving um, nomination um, at the 2007 Oscars was Helen Mirren, um, Helen Mirren winning for the Queen uh, for playing Queen Elizabeth. Like, um, she was most deserving that year. Like, she was up against like Penelope Cruz for Volvo, um, Judy Dench, Meryl Streep, and Kate Winslet. I think she had the better performance that year because not only did she just um merge into the role of Queen Elizabeth, you I uh, you honestly thought that you were watching a documentary about Queen Elizabeth. She really put her all into this role and she totally deserved like she definitely um was that well and like she was so good um like she continued to play that role in other avenues um like stage shows and that let down the line so all right so helen Mirren is the first answer on the board ross which one are you headed for one minute you are still muted sir sorry i i went with the departed the Departed, you know, like is a masterpiece, and then like you know, like it almost felt like you know, like um, 
in a way, it's because like, you know, like I didn't go with best director. I went with best picture, but about like Scorsese's, you know, like com- coming out party, you know, you know, like, and then like, you know, like it has like Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, Matt Damon, Jack Nicholson, Alec Baldwin, Marky Mark actually giving a good performance. And then like, you know, now like, you know, you know, now, now, now like it takes the mafia genre and it kind of like throws this on its head and like in a way. And, and then like it, it is literally the most remembered movie of 2006, six more than the queen queen. But, but like, I, I will, I, I will do that later on. And then like, I'll explain why, why, but yeah, but I, I yield my time. All right, so it is Helen Mirren winning for Best Actress versus The Departed winning Best Picture. With that said, Malcolm, we'll turn it back over to you for two more minutes when ready. And now you're muted. Um, Just because The Departed is the most remembered movie of 2007, doesn't necessarily mean it was the one that deserved to win Best Picture. Like I can sit, like I can see arguments for all the movies that were nominated that year for winning over The Departed. Um, but when it comes to Helen Moon, like um, Helen Moon deserved that win. Like, um, and people like, well, yes, The Queen may not be the most remembered movie, but it's. But in this community, a lot of this, a lot, a lot of people remember the more actiony movies. They don't really remember a lot of the drum movies, especially the British drum movies. But Helen Mirren's performance in the in the movie is just groundbreaking. Like she, like you just forget you're watching a movie about Queen Elizabeth reacting to Princess Diana's death. Um, it's and. Um, and yeah, I mean, like, well, you see how people nominated that movie made good, like, Mill Street is great, but I think Helen Moon is the better one on that one thing. And I think The Parted is a fine movie, like, I think, um, I, I mean, not, not that this is part of the argument, but I think The Queen should have won Best Picture that year, my personally. Um, I yield the rest of my time. Okay. All right. Give me just one second, sir, just to get the timer up to date there. Sorry about that. Nope. No, no, no. You're good. You're good. There we go. Okay. I'm a little bit ahead, but it'll revert uh, when you're there. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Like, you know, like, yes, my film is most remembered in that, and that, like, doesn't mean good. But, no, like, what it's remembered for, though, is that Steven Spielberg, I mean, sorry, sorry, oh, I, I, Sorry, uh, Martin Scorsese finally got his Oscar, his his like two Oscars. But but I'm talking about the best picture one because like he was a producer. And then like yes 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 you know you know no like like and then like you know you know no like it was just just like time. And then like yes with Helen Mirren's time, but the fact that like she you know like she now like went on to do it in stage plays. You said doesn't really matter is because like you know like this is the off we're talking about the oscars and then like this film you know like the departing you know you know now no, like you know like they realized oh crap you know like you know like uh, martin scorsese doesn't have an oscar and then and, like this is one of his best films so so then they literally you know like decided to give it to martin scorsese for best picture because like he was like he was like way overdue this was his fourth or fifth nomination, you know, like for best picture. So then they realized that, you know, like, so, so yes. And, and then, and then like, you know, you know, as, as I said before, you know, not, not like it takes a mafia genre and then, it, and, it, and then it not, not, like, you know, like turns it on, 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 on its head is because, you know, you know, not, like not that many mafia stories also now like focus, fo- focus on, on the moles inside both sides. There's usually a mole on one side. And then, like, this film actually does something brilliant is where it tells you who the moles are from the start. Usually the mole is a mystery. So then they really do, like, they realize, oh, crap, this is, this is like, this is, like, the most, like, deserving movie. Along with it is tied to 
Martin Scorsese, one of the greats, to getting a win. So, yes, I yield my time. Okay. We're going to go into the four-minute open discussion. Timer starts back up when the first competitor speaks. Look, if they had to give a movie to someone because they haven't won it before, is it really the best movie? Um, is it really best picture? Um, look, you said it yourself. Um, they gave it to The Departed because Martin Scorsese doesn't have an Oscar yet. He should have had one many times before for many better movies. Um, like he should have been nominated for ta um, Taxi Driver. He should have been nominated for other movies. Um, but um, it, uh, but it's one of those ones like, um, well, yes, Helen Mirren hadn't won an Oscar at that point, or like at least it's been a while since she'd won an Oscar. Um, but she deserved it for that role, like, um. She literally became the queen in the movie and um and was incredible. Um so she totally deserved it, even though um like people do argue, oh yeah, may have been a career Oscar. It may have been a career Oscar, but she deserved it for that role. Um like I can see arguments for Little Miss Sunshine, there's for me Erojima, the Queen. Oh in my opinion, better movies than The Departed. Um, um, and yeah, so either one of them probably should have won um, over The Departed. Yeah, but Hell Mirren's though was also a career award. So, so if not like she had like three Oscar nominations, shouldn't should she have won one before that? You know, like so. Yes, and 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 then you say like you know, like all those movie, movies are better maybe but but then like you know like like if you think about 2006 people still think about the the departed and, and then like people remember it, it was scorsese's you know you know like year so like and then and then like i know i'm like being being remembered is important but then like people knew that knew that knew that like scorsese was worthy already you know like people knew that score 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 scorsese was worthy for the best picture you know like he needed you know, like so so yeah so then uh, like you know like this one is actually like one of like one of one of like Scorsese's best movies as I said because like it flips the mafia genre and the mole genre on its head we've never seen a film where we know who the mole is who both moles are at the start and then and then like you know like you know now like the queen is just another like I mean Helmir was good but like you could argue that the one from the crown is actually better be because we get to spend more more time more time with her and yeah yeah yes like hell mirren i could have named like she should have gotten an oscar for like camelot so yes and then i think that that's actually a better performance than the queen so you say that you know like if somebody was like overdue do then like then they should have gotten it before is it really 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 like like their best movie and the best performance you could say the same thing about Helen Mirren. So, yeah. But the thing is, I did say the same thing about Helen Mirren. Like, um, I said, like, it may have been a career Oscar, but it's also one of those what, times where the career Oscar is the best performance as at the same time. Um, Like, well, yes, she probably should have got it early for other movies. But she deserved the Oscar for the Queen, and that is the truth. Yeah, you know, you're, hold on. Uh, <laughs> and time. All right, we're going to go into the one minute closing here, gentlemen. Malcolm, you're back up first. One ready. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think Helen Moon deserved the Oscar for the Queen. A lot. Well, yes. You may argue it's a career Oscar. She's the only giving to her because they haven't awarded her something yet. Um, like yeah, she probably should have got it for like Gods of Park, which she was also nominated for and other things. But that's the thing. She also deserved like it may be a career Oscar, but it's a career Oscar that she deserved. Um, and 
um, and the other nominees in that category don't compare to what she did in the Queen. Um, meanwhile, with The Departed, like, um, it's if I was to do a top ten list of Martin Scorsese movies, Departed wouldn't would be ten or eleven. Like it would barely make the list if I was. He's got better movies that he probably should have won Oscars for already. And time. All right, and then Ross, over to you when ready. Okay. When you said that, you know, um, that that like it was it was it was not like Harold Mirren's first nomination in a long time. She was nominated in two thousand two. Before that, that's not that long. So yeah, and then and then like you know you know now like. Yes, and then like, yes, and then you say the career award, you know, like, also too, you know, like Scorsese. As I, as I, as I have said many, many. Okay, the Queen is just a Helen Mirren is good in it, but she's not amazing. She's very, very, very good. But the like, you know, like, but the party, you know, like as I said before, like takes the genre and does new things with it. And then like, you know, you know, not like so, so yes, and then like it was just time. Time and then and then like you know um he really did it he really it, it is actually like it's actually like one 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 of the score says he's best and then like you know like and yes there were other good movies that year but though like you know you know and then they say that it is time you know to wrap in and, and time. all right guys thank you so much for another good round there I'm gonna go ahead and put you in the back and bring the judges forward here. Uh, so just a couple of fact checks to clean up while you guys come to your final decisions there. Uh, just some wrap-up thoughts. Uh, so a lot of, obviously, stuff about wins and nominations and all that to clean up. So we'll just run through them quickly here. Uh, so the first thing is uh, Martin Scorsese, of course, did receive. So, again, to clarify when you're thinking, so there's going to be a lot of other stuff that comes up here. The argument was for Mirren for Actress, Departed for Best Picture. Now, obviously, Departed did win other Academy Awards that night. Martin Scorsese did go home with a Best Director Award. He did not receive an Academy Award for producing. He is not a credited producer on the film. He's actually not a credited producer on most of his films. Uh, the film was produced by Brad Pitt, Brad Gray, and Graham King. However, famously, this is one of the few instances where a Best Picture winner did not give a trophy to all of its credited producers. Brad Pitt and Brad Gray did not receive an Oscar for their work on the film. They were producers because they secured the rights to remake in Infernal Affairs. They financed the film and brought everybody on board, but they had so little to do with the actual day-to-day -day production of the film that they were deemed ineligible to win the award, and thus Graham King was the only person who walked away with an award for that film for producing. Uh, in terms of Martin Scorsese and his legacy at the Oscars, uh, again, talking about his direction and him winning an Oscar, because that was a lot of the debate as well. Uh, the Departed was the first time that he had won an Oscar uh, specifically uh, for directing, he had been nominated five times previously for Raging Bull, The Last Temptation of Christ, Goodfellas, Gangs of New York, and The Aviator. He had not won any. He had also re received two screenplay nominations for Goodfellas and The Age of Innocence, which he did not win. Uh, he has also not won any of the six nominations that he has received since. Uh, in terms of Best Picture nominations, which is what The Departed won. It was also the sixth time he had been nominated, the uh, first time that he won. Previously, Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, Goodfellas, Gangs of New York, and The Aviator were all nominated. None of them did win Best Picture. Uh, and then in terms of Helen Mirren, this was her third nomination for Actress, first win. She had previously been nominated for The Madness of King George and Gosford Park in 95 and 2002, respectively. She would be nominated one more time after in 2010 for The Last Station. And then the last thing is, uh, it, it's a hard thing to fact check because it's an incredibly subjective concept. But when it comes to talking about the Oscars, it's hard to ignore this thing that exists called the legacy oscar and basically the idea is a preconceived amongst the general public and movie fans that certain oscars that were given away were just because the person who won the oscar is an acclaimed actor who had previously not won for an award in which they were perceived to have won an award for one of the most famous double handers is when denzel did not win for malcolm x instead pacino won for scent of a woman after not winning previously for a movie people thought he should have won for and then denzel would later win for training day in 2002 a movie that most people feel is not better than the performances he had been nominated for previously so on and so forth you can continue on from there um 
it's a hard thing to subjectify because it's all just a matter of opinion. Obviously, the Academy stance is always going to be the one that won the award is the one that was deemed the most worthy because it was the one that was voted on. But also when you are an industry voting on an award and you acknowledge that somebody who is a big part of your industry has never won an Oscar before, that may cause you to lean towards it if you think they are worthy of being the recipient that year. Uh, famously, last year, Jamie Lee Curtis won her first Oscar on her first nomination, an award that many people in the general public don't believe she should have received, which, again, of course, is all just subjective opinion, right? So it's one of those things where it's a big part of both arguments, but it's hard to actually quantify what is and isn't a legacy award unless you literally sit down and analyze every single year that anyone's ever been nominated for any award ever and sort of just follow the path through. Uh, but that said, you guys have your decisions made by now, so I can stop killing time. Alan, I'll go up to you first. Who gets your vote, sir? And what was the main selling point? Well, the uh, the positive thing about Jamie Lee Curtis winning is, it, is she didn't slap anybody. So, you know, there's that. All right. So um, I uh, <laughs> I liked – this was rough because it was, you know, um, an actor versus a movie. So, But I thought they did a good job kind of, you know, defending their, their win, right? Um, uh, Malcolm and Ross. So, the, but it was tricky because it was two very different things. Um, mm -hmm. However, I think Ross pulled it out just a little bit more. So, I went with uh, went with Ross. Okay, Nick, down to you. Yeah, very similar arguments. Uh, and that that made it tough because they are two wildly different categories, and to compare them one by one, apples to apples, is kind of bizarre to see so it was a little bit going back and forth for me i i ultimately lean towards malcolm i think that uh him he at least brought up that there was another movie that should have won for best picture and i don't think that ross and his arguments to try to take down helen mirror never mentioned anyone who would who should have beaten her for that award so let it go with malcolm all right which means tato will go to you for the tie break Yep, I will echo Nick's sentiment there. Uh, their arguments for were ultimately equal. The arguments of the legacy thing canceled itself out. So the thing it came down to was Malcolm, Malcolm throwing out like, hey, at least this could have happened this way. All right. Well, judges, thank you, guys. We'll go ahead and sit you in the back, and we'll jump into question number three of this matchup as we go ahead and bring the competitors back in. Uh, and question number three, we're going to be moving on to a filmmaker who would later win, and I can't stress this enough, a fuck ton of Oscars with his films, uh, but not during this period, and that's why I think it's intriguing to talk about it. The question is, which of Peter Jackson's 80s or 90s films would be the most successful if released today? And in parentheses, I've added there, we're not remaking the film, just quite literally, if the film came out for the first time today, which would be the most successful? Because a lot of people argue there's a lot of really good quality in the early part of Peter Jackson's career, but he didn't really gain a whole lot of notoriety, whether he was dabbling in the drama genre, the horror genre, even a little bit of comedy in some of these films. None of it really clicked for him until it came to the Lord of the Rings. And so I think there's a lot of untapped potential in these early films, and I'm curious to see them argue about it. Uh, it's going to be tough to watch the man himself argue against Ross, but Ross, I'm sure you'll do an admirable job. Uh, no, all jokes aside, though, Ross, you are up first on this question, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to you when you are ready. Good, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, we got to, I got to specify this, though, okay? Okay. Throw away the disease thing, you know. Imagine like if the Frighteners, the same movie, were released today, starring Peter Jackson. I mean, directed by Peter Jackson, starring Michael J. Fox in a fun, spooky PG thirteen horror movie, horror horror ghost story. And I know that. And and then like you know like and plus, plus plus like people love to see actors go go against type. Michael J. Fox in this movie plays an asshole. So yes, and like you know, like good old Michael J. Fox. Imagine him in a ghost story where where he plays a con man directed by Peter Jackson. People would go nuts for it. And then like you know, like like the story is is is, is I will not spoil the story except for like he plays an asshole. And then like you know, like and then like you know he's just a crazy guy. And then and then like you know like he would just stick with it. And time. 
All right. So the Frighteners is the first pick. Malcolm, over to you for yours. Um, yeah. So um, for me, I picked um, Heavenly Creatures, and I think um, this would be the most successful um, if it was released today. Um, Peter, because like the story is a really interesting story. Like basically, the story is about it's a, a real life story about this girl who befriends another girl and, um, and they bond over a history of uh, childhood disease and hospitalizations. And, but then together they create a fantasy kingdom called Brovnia. Um, and it's, they then sort of go in and then, um, go into the world and sort of get, um, get here. Um, but yeah, there's a lot more to it, um, but I think it'll, it'll work so well as, like, um, movies based on true stories really worked. Um. And time. All right, Ross, back over to you. Two minutes. Okay, yours is a little – I've seen your film. Your film is a little too weird, and, like, people today, I – they would like it, but the general, but you know, like, but the when you say it would be the biz, biz, biggest success, you know, uh, you know, the, the most successful, my film literally would have starred Michael J. Fox, you know, like with, with, with Peter Jackson. Michael J. Fox is in one of the biggest movies of all time. He actually had a pretty successful career, you know, like before. So then, like, him literally, you know, him actually, you know, like starring in a ghost story, a CGI ghost fest. And I know that the Haunted Mansion did not, didn't do well. That, that was because of the overinflated budget. If it had the budget it did back then, people would have lined up to see it with, with like P Peter Jackson's name. Because like, I think the reason that that, that like was not a success is because people didn't know Peter Jackson's name. And your film it's just a little bit too weird to be successful. It's a good film, but though like yours, you know, like, okay, I know that yours is based on a true story, but the fantasy elements, I think might've taken people out just a bit. So yeah, I yield my time. All right, Malcolm, we'll turn it back over to you, sir. You got two minutes on the clock as soon as I can get it up there. That's close enough. When it rolls over to zero, you're good to go. But here's the thing. If the Fright Nights was released today, all the special effects would be super outdated and will look really bad. And that will take a lot of people out of the movie. Uh, because we're not talking about... Remember, we're not talking about remaking the movies. We're talking about the movies released as they were back in the 90s. So all the visual effects on the Fright Nights will be bad. Like, well, yes, mine... That my fantasy elements does have visual effects as well, um, and, may, and some of those might look a little outdated. It's not going to be as egregious as it was at, as the Frighteners because they literally use visual effects to um, a lot in that movie. Um, and it's one of those ones like um, releasing it today, some people might have forgotten who Michael J. Fox is. Well, yes, Michael J. Fox is known for Back to the Future. Um, and that's about it. But Heavenly Creatures has got Kate Winslet in it. Um, and Kate Winslet is really well known. And she's like, um, well, yes, when the movie was initially released, Kate Winslet was unknown. But releasing it today, Kate Winslet would have been known for Titanic, um, at, known as being a multi-time Oscar winner. Um, and even Melanie Linsky would, would have been known for the TV series Yellow Jackets and stuff. So, um, so it's one of those ones like, and um, and you want to talk about like the movie's too weird. Like, this is an era where people go and flock to the cinemas to watch Yorgos Lanthimos movies, and he's got really weird movies, and people like them. So. So I think this can work, like, just because it's weird. Just shouldn't make it not, not get to work today. And time. All right, we're going to go into the four-minute open discussion. Timer starts back up when the first competitor speaks. Yeah, but, like, people, 
they still know who he he is though you know people still know who michael j fox and yes people people know who k k was it is and then like you know like the general public is not going to see your yorgos lanthimos and then and then yeah yes the film fans they could literally like make turn a movie into a little bit of a profit but the general public you know like the general public still know who michael j fox is and they'll and they they'll go Oh yeah, it's the Back to the Future guy, and then and then like I can see people actually, you know, like liking how much practical effects are in the movie. Yes, the CGI effects are outdated, but the practical effects though are still amazing. So yeah, you know, like I I could see you know like pe- people going for Peter Jackson and and then like Michael J. Fox, and and then like you know like and and then like I think that Heavenly Creatures is just a little bit too weird for the general public. I mean, my, people might argue the same about Frighteners. They might think the Frighteners is a re- too weird of a movie. Um, but it's one of those ones, like, um, once again, it's one of those ones that, like, sometimes you don't know what the general public want half the time. <laughs> like, if you were to tell me today that Barbara's going to make a um, million dollars, I would have said you were crazy. But here we are. It's made a million dollars so um so i mean it's one of those ones like it comes down to name like well yes we both have a star that the general public will know um really well if the movies are released today but it's also one of those ones like um heavenly creatures i think will appeal to a lot of people because a lot of people as i said um in an earlier like a lot of people do tend to like drum movies like when it comes to horror comedy some people don't like horror movies they don't won't go to see it um like well yes the horror the crowd of people that like oh will probably go see it and will enjoy it for what it is but but drama movies appeal to more people and it's one of those ones like the fantasy elements is not a big part of heavily creatures at all that it's it's more about the the relationship between the girls and the murder and all that that happens yeah but i mean i mean like you know like in people like you know like they've actually proven though that they like to see like actors that they know doing different things and then like michael j fox is actually doing something that's the opposite of marty mcfly so yeah so like you know like he plays an asshole in it so so yeah and, like, and then like i know that like some people they don't like horror comedy but the like horror is actually more the mainstream today than it was back then and then like i could see like your film have like having some trouble with some um conservatives not not to get political you know they'll have issues with not like with not like your movie and maybe mine a little bit but you know like, like the two girls and stuff you know i could not see i see like doing doing that very well and then like you know you're right about the general public but the like you know like 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 how come is it then then like how, how come is it you know like these like like these like micro budget movies you know um are doing how can these micro budget horror movies are doing well if if the general public doesn't really like horror i i mean they're doing well because they're a micro budget movie like the horror community is a really big community like all it takes is for enough people to go see it to make for it to make money so i mean like what you can't assume that all, all that money is just because of the general public. <laughs> like it could just be the whole community that is helping make the money. So. Yeah, but your film, you know, like would would not make that much, you know, because of the girls thing. And time. All right, we're gonna go into the one minute closing. Ross, back over to you when ready. Okay, okay. Like you're talking about, you know, like we don't know what the general public wants. You're right, but the like, and I think that like your film is actually way more of a risk. Is because of you know the fantasy. Uh, I mean, like of the weird, weird, weird fantasy and the thing with the two girls in it. You know, like that's not going to appeal to everyone. And then like horror, I know, I know also. But like you know, like as I've said before, you know, you know, like the general there. There's actually been like studies on this too. And I got and then I forget where 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 it was like why like they like seeing you know, like actors normally in one role do something else. So yeah, so yeah, you know, like so like imagine Michael J. Fox as an asshole. In a in a funny movie in a funny horror comedy coming out around Halloween, you know, like playing an asshole. 
I think that people would actually like eat that up directed by Peter Jackson. So yeah, I yield my time. And that time I was muted. There we go. It's happened to everyone. All right, Malcolm, we'll turn it over to you, sir, when you are ready. Go ahead. See, I don't think people really care if an actor does something completely different um, and plays against type. Um, but I, I'm like, it's all realistically, it's going to come down to how, um, how they market the movies for both, both on both accounts. Um, because from the trailer, like, I didn't get any of the assholeness of Michael J. Fox. Um, and honestly, I don't think it was that much of an asshole in the movie. Um, and that's just me. Um, but as well, well, yes, some conservatives will have an issue with the homosexual parts of the movie. But once again, the conservatives don't make up in a whole lot of the general public. Um, once again, it's really hard to know realistically which one will be successful. But I think Heavenly Creatures is the one that can appeal to the more most of the general public more than the frightness. And that will be time on the round. Uh, we'll go ahead <coughs> and throw it to the judges uh, for this one. We'll sit you guys in the back here. Uh, I do have some fact checks and uh, fun things to play with. I should turn my camera back on. Uh, as I bring the judges in here. Uh, all right, so, yeah, because there was a lot of speculative things that were said, so I was trying to keep up with it as much as I could and sort of uh, fact-check and put some things together here. Uh, okay, so in terms of the first thing that was brought up was the recognizability of the stars of the film. Uh, in terms of The Frighteners, the only person today that really would sell the film on name alone is Michael J. Fox. Uh, in terms of where he was in 1996, uh, at that point, uh, he had just begun his run on the show Spin City, uh, which would last until 2000 when he was diagnosed with Parkinson's, or uh, diagnosed slightly before that. But that would be uh, most of his career for the late 90s was that show. Uh, so certainly a well-known name. Uh, there's an argument to be made that he is more well-known now. Uh, simply because of his advocacy for Parkinson's and the sympathy that the public has garnered for him. So certainly you could make an argument there. Uh, in terms of Kate Winslet and Melanie Linsky, both stars of Heavenly Creatures, again, they were both uh, young teens at that time, so both very much so much more known in today's climate. They're also the only two actors in that movie that would really be known. Um Okay, so the next uh, so the next part of this is uh, there was the comparison made between something like the Frighteners and a modern day something like that, which would be Haunted Mansion. Uh, so for what it's worth, the two aren't a hundred percent comparable. The Haunted Mansion is a major blockbuster picture. Uh, even if you deflate its budget down to 1996 numbers, it still costs 77 million to make. So it has a much higher budget than that of the Frighteners. Um, but with that said, if you took the gross that the Haunted Mansion had, uh, which uh, in theaters it's made $91.7 million so far, uh, again, in modern terms, this movie is a complete flop for Disney. And if you stuck that $26 million budget on it, let's say somehow they made it for that much in 1996, it would have made money. So the logic is 100% there, but theory is correct in that comparably you can sort of find comparisons there. Uh, the next comparison and theory that was made was to director Yorgos Lanthimos comparing the idea of heavenly creatures to something that he would make nowadays. Uh, because this was a breakout film for Jackson, I chose to compare it specifically to The Lobster. Um, if you were to take The Lobster's gross from 2015, which was $18 million, and reduce it back to uh, 1994 numbers, that would be about a $7.7 .7 million gross. Uh, which would make money on the very cheap budget that Heavenly Creatures had. Uh, so again, not a whole comparison, but something that is close enough that you could argue for it. Uh, and then the final comparison that was speculative was comparing The Frighteners to modern-day micro-budget horror films. That I would call factually incorrect. Uh, the Frighteners budget, when increased to $2023, was made for $50.5 million. That is far from a micro-budget. It would be a mid-budget film, but certainly not a micro-budget film in the Golden Hollywood standard. Uh, and then the final point was about the... Uh, basically to summarize it, the political spectrum of people and how they would react to certain things in certain films. 
I'm going to wash that point out from a fact checking perspective by saying this summer we had The Sound of Freedom, a film distributed by Angel Pictures, starring known QAnon supporter Jim Caviezel, be a huge box office success. And we had Barbie, which was, you know, as some people would call feminist movement, the movie also be a huge success at the box office. And then you had something like Oppenheimer, which falls somewhere in the middle in the political sphere, also be a huge success at the box office. So I think anything can succeed in the right climate. Uh, And obviously, I'm not saying that any of those films stand for anything politically. But the point is, when you're pointing things to one side or the other, anything can truly succeed if it has the right release, the right climate, and the people there to support it. That said, Nick, I'll go up to you first. Uh, who gets your vote, and what was the main selling point? Again, another another tough uh, debate. I decided to go with Malcolm. I think that he did a better job at taking down the Frighteners and talking about how it would be hokey and it wouldn't necessarily be you know, the, the kind of nostalgia trip that I think Ross was hoping it for it to be if it was released today. Um, and I did like his point about horror comedies being kind of polarizing or hit or miss among audiences, so I decided to go with that. All right, Tato, down to you, good sir. Um, as fun as it was to write asshole Jay Fox on my board, Malcolm did it the rest of the way. Um, just pretty much countered every point Ross had. Um, the, he got to the point of the question, the Kate Winslet thing far outbalances the Michael J. Fox thing at this point. Um, just, yep, yeah, Malcolm in general there. All right. Judges, thank you guys. We'll go ahead and sit you in the back, and we'll jump into question number four of this matchup as I bring our competitors back in here. Uh, and question number four, we took it we took it back to the 90s for that question. We're going to take it way back this time to something that I think would su- succeed today uh, simply because we need better monster films than schlock like The Last Voyage of the Demeter. The question is, what is the most underrated of the universal classic monsters films? A good, I mean, God, wh- how long did this technically last? Like 30 years did they designate this series or something? It, it's, it's I like, don't know. Long... It was the first cinematic universe, too. So, Yeah, it, was, it, it, it lasted for a long, long time. A lot of classic characters were developed in this universe. Arguably, for monster horror, it is the archetype to turn to. And in the modern era, there's so many ways you could define underrated for something that was made so long ago. And I'm curious to see where these guys went with it. Uh, Malcolm, you're up first this time around, sir. So I'll turn the timer to you when you are ready. Go ahead. Um, Funny enough, bringing it right back around to um, Titanic. um, I'm bringing up the the movie The Invisible Man from 1933. like this does um Gloria Stewart who played old Rose in Titanic, um, which shows how long ago this was there. Um but um but yeah, I, I think this is one that um doesn't get talked about a lot. And I think it it's because I think it's one of those ones that I think more people talk about the twenty twenty version than this one. I think and I think this one is just a really good movie, like the cast, um like like is relatively notable. Like you've got Gloria Stewart, you've got Claude Rains. Um, but yeah, um, I yield the rest of my time. All right. So the Invisible Man is the first choice on the table. Uh, and I'll, I'll go ahead and clarify here just for everybody at home because I didn't bother writing dates next to them. Again, these are in case you didn't. These are specifically the versions of the films in the Universal Classic Monsters recognized series. Uh, So not the 2020 version, the classic 1933 version. And for Ross's answer, we're focusing on the one that doesn't feature the schlocky Joel Schumacher soundtrack. With that said, Ross, take it away. Okay. Mine is the 1943 Claude Rains Phantom of the Opera. And then, like, you know, like, Claude Rains is a great actor. And then, like, you know, like, this one, you know, you know, like, there's actually some, like, okay, there are some actually like really scary parts that I'll explain later, you know, like for modern day, day even. And then the makeup, you know, like is just amazing. And then like, you know, you know, you know, like I remember like, you know, like, like, and then, and then like, you know, like it's just, this movie is, is so creepy. And and then, you know, like I picked the 19, 1943 Phantom, Phantom of the Opera. And then like, you know, like, like, and then like, and the mask is different, different too, you know? So yeah, I yield my time. 
All right. So it is the Phantom of the Opera versus the Invisible Man. Uh, again, some some real classics there in that franchise. Two great ones here. That said, Malcolm, you got two minutes on the clock when ready. It's also Claude Rains versus Claude Rains. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, I, I honestly, I was thinking about saying that in my head, and then I didn't want to look like a dumbass in case I misheard <laughs> one of you, like, quote another actor. I was like, does he star in both of those? Or? Um, but anyway, like... Boris Karloff. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, look. Um, Phantom of the Opera is, um, is really good, but it's one of those ones like I think it's rated enough because I think it's it's severe. I mean, I, I think it's just one of those ones like it was made into much like more interesting takes. Um, when they when uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber can this did the musical, um, but I think The Invisible Man is one of those ones that, um, was really underrated because I think um the 2020 version of the event made people want to go back to watch the original 1933 version um and and I think it's just one of those ones that um people really forgot about until they remade it um with Phantom of the Opera um no one ever really talks about it they always talk about the angelo dreber musical um or you'll lose my time yeah but like i remember oh, you sorry. sorry sorry no 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 you're good i appreciate the enthusiasm i just want to make sure i don't fuck up the timer here yeah i get it i get it all right go ahead sir okay underrated means that like people do not talk about it and then like you know like no one talks about mine it's because you know, you know, like it was actually um there's been like multiple ones, but the like mine though, like actually has scenes that are scary for today's audiences, like the scene, like you know, um who go down in, into the phantom's lair, there are literal rats there, you know, like and then like, like the Indiana Jones uh King uh Last Crusade actually took from that scene with the rats you know like how many rats there are down there and then like you know and the phantom's makeup is actually um scary because like instead of like wearing a half mask he wears like almost like like one that goes down to his mouth because like that's how disfigured he is and then the, you know you know you know like i had seen what he looks like beforehand underneath the underneath it but though but but like you know the movie sweeps you in and then like you forget what he looks like. And then, like, your your movie, I like. It's just, like, a little bit too slow. You know, you know, you know, like, my, my filming, like, it's, it has slow elements. But, like, your filming, you know, you know, it's mostly a character study, study, you know, like, on the back, you know, like, up until uh, up until the end. So, yeah, you know, like, my, my, my film is also a character study while the action is going on. So, yeah, I yield my time. All right, we're going to jump into the four-minute portion next. Timer will start back up. Once it turns zero, the first person can speak. Um, but yeah, I mean, if your definition is um, underrated and means that no one talks about it, then you can argue... You can argue the same for the Invisible Webbers. No one talked about that movie until they remade it. So if they were to remake Phantom of the Opera, maybe people talk about it more. Uh, but it's one of those ones like, um, like horror movies don't have to be scared, scared, scared. They they can take the time for the scares, and that's what I like about the Invisible Man. Like um, sometimes too much scares can turn people off wanting to actually finish watching the movie. Yeah, but though, you know, like, like your film is almost a slog. My film ha my film doesn't have constant scares. It's like this, it's like scare, then a slow build up. And then, and then like, you know, no, 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 like everyone remembers the, whenever people like th think about, you know, like, like the family opera, they think about the musical, 
or the 1920s one. And then like you know, like this one is a is a is a hidden gem because like it actually uses like modern scares in 1943. Your film feels like a movie out of the 30s. It's a good film, but you know like but but now like you know like mine though you know like a lot of films take from it as I said before. Like, you know, you know, like Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, the rat scene. And then like, you know, like, like it actually has like very modern, modern makeup too. And then like, you know, like that you forget. And the Phantom Mask, I think is the creepiest thing, creepiest one out of, out of, out of like all the Phantoms. And, and then like, you know, like, like, like the acting in it is good. But like, and I think it has a young, young, young Michael Goff in it too. But like your film is good. It's just a little bit too slow. So, so like. So I don't think it's really that underrated, you know, be because like everyone remembers it, remembers your version. But that's the thing; they only remember my version because the remade remake forced a lot of people to go back and revisit it. Because no one ever talked about it until they remade it. Um, and I mean, I could be wrong, but I think there is talks of doing a, re um, a remake of this version of Phantom of the Opera down the line. So like and, and um I I'm pretty sure that once Pete once it gets remade, um if that ever does happen, then people will go back and revisit Phantom of the Opera. So I mean I remember though in the year like like when Hallman came out, people were saying, Oh, this is just like the Invisible Man. And then like when people think about the Invisible Man, you know like they they always talk about the one with the bandage. While my film has been in like remake remake limbo for years, so no one no one talks about it, you know. Like and like people people have have been talking about you know like you're you're like Invisible Man since it came out. That is like literally the if you look up the Invisible Man on Google Images, that's the first thing. So so it's like your film is remembered, mine mine really isn't. So I mean, it's one of those ones. It's one thing to know the name of a movie. But to actually have seen the movie is another one because, like once again, people know the name of Venom the Opera for like not just the music, like people like depending on which community you're in, like people will do know the name because um a lot of people go like talking about the Venom of the Opera, they will either talk about the twenties one, they will talk about the forties one. I have heard people talk about the forties one, or they'll talk about the musical. Like, but it's. It's one of those ones like, um, while people may know of the Invisible Man, um, the and time. Sorry about that. I was a little slow in the draw there. Uh, we're gonna go into the closing. Uh, so Malcolm, you are up first when you're ready. Um, yeah. So it's one thing to be aware of a movie, um, but it's one of those ones like. To me, underrated is just one that doesn't come up in conversation a lot. And The Invisible Man is one of those ones that um, that people only really discovered um, until they once they remade it. Like, well, yes, people may talk about it. They may know of his existence. But knowing it exists is not the same thing as... Um, actually seeing the movie and rating it. Um, the Phantom of the Opera, like, um, once again, people know of that existence too, but no one, like, everyone prefers the musical version of it over it. And, um, and yeah, um, and, but, and, well, Invisible Man is slow. It, it's not um, a lot of scares. And time. All right, and then Ross, back over to you. Final minute. Yeah, but like you know, like people know about my, you know, like like remember what I said though about in two in the year two thousand, people were saying that like you know like oh I bet you a lot more people have seen you know like you know like your movie than than mine, and then like mine is truly underrated because like no one talks about it, no one no one no one that like really really like no one's really seen it you know like a small a small group, but but like remember what I said though. Why, when Hollow Man came out, pe people were saying like, "Okay, now like this is just another Invisible Man." So, so like people knew about your film even back in the two 
2000s. No one really talks yeah. about the 1943 one. They either talk they talk about the 1920s one or the, or the musical. There's no 1943 one, you know, like and, and that and that is just a shame because you know, like it is a underrated je- 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 yeah, gem gem that is truly the definition of being underrated. All right. That is time. All right, I'm going to go ahead and sit you guys both in the back here as the judges will come in for their decision. All right, so in terms of uh, any real quick fact checks here, uh, so in terms of The Invisible Man, of course, uh, there was a sequel to it. The Universal Monster uh, classic films often got sequels. Uh, There was a remake, of course, that came in 2020, uh, initially, it was supposed to be a part of what was known as the Dark Universe. Uh, however, that bombed so hard that the film was just separated off and made into its own entity. Um, supposedly, that 2020 film, a continuing the legacy of the Invisible Man, supposedly they are set to continue that uh, with an Invisible Woman spinoff and a sequel to that film. However, the last that anything was heard about either of those films was 2020. So there's a good chance by this point that they're both dead in the water. Uh, in terms of Phantom of the Opera, the 1943 one actually did have a sequel uh, that uh, began at least in some sense of pre-production called The Climax. However, it did not see completion and was never released. Uh, in terms of a remake, a Phantom of the Opera remake was announced a couple of years ago. However, it is not a remake of that film specifically. It's a readaptation of the original novel. Uh, it is the film supposedly called Phantom. It is written by John Fusco, who wrote the Netflix film The Highwaymen, uh, and is being produced by John Legend's production company. The film will be a modern retelling of The Phantom of the Opera, set in modern-day New Orleans. Uh, And the last anyone heard anything about that was early 2022, so again, presumably either dead in the water or somewhere in production. Uh, The other thing I fact-checked was just out of sheer curiosity, because it's an interesting point, Uh, I did type both these titles into Google verbatim and Google them just to see what came up. Uh, And I'll go ahead and turn my phone around so you guys can see. Uh, So when you Google The Invisible Man, the first thing that does come up is the cover of the new film, the poster. But then immediately after that, you do see images from the Claude Rains film. So obviously it does come up quick enough. Uh, When it comes to The Phantom of the Opera, uh, if I can get it to come back here. Here we go. When it comes to The Phantom of the Opera... Once you Google it, and I'll just keep scrolling here, everything is either the 2004 film or it is the Lloyd Webber stage musical and it's various renditions or just like the random mask there. Uh, I scrolled for a while behind the scenes. Almost no images come up from either the 43 film or the 25 film or any other type of adaptation that exists. It's literally all just the musical. When you Google the title, you would have to redefine the search to try and find another image from one of those films. Uh, so with that said, Jake, we'll go up to you first. Who gets your vote, and what was the selling point? Yeah, this one was an interesting one. Ultimately, because uh, they were making a lot of similar points, I believe, but ultimately Malcolm made one defining statement about people did not see it to rate it. So Malcolm got the point with that statement there. All right. Alan, to you, sir. Uh, me and Tato on the same page is exactly right. I mean, I had it was the last uh, moment, and Malcolm pulled that up, um, or you know, brought that to the attention. So I went Malcolm as well. All right. Well, judges. With that said, thank you guys so much. I'm gonna go ahead and sit everyone in the back though, because your winner by a final score of three to one is Malcolm Lay. Malcolm, it has been a long while since I've been able to say that. Congratulations, sir. How are you feeling? Um, I'm 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 feeling good. Look, um, being a little bit sick with it, um, so for her is it was annoying, but um, but yeah, um, I I I'm, I was completely surprised. I I thought for sure I was going to the Brian round because, um. The last question, I was just completely bullshitting my way through it. I've not seen any of those movies. I didn't do any preparation for that. So I was like, eh, I, I, I'll lose. It's going to go to the blind round and see what happens. But it's like, so I was pleased to try to get the win there. Um, and But yeah, winning, and even with stuffing up, um, picking for that first question, um, 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, of course, you know, we're at that point in the season where everyone's pretty much wrapping up their run. Uh, we've already we've already held discussions about potentially what next season could look like for you. But at the very least, you can say you end this season on a win. Uh, so how are you feeling overall heading out? Um, I'm I'm feeling pretty good. Um, it's one of those ones like I have fun like doing background talking about movies and that, but it's just one of those ones that um depending on what next season um brings, I don't know. There is one guy I would like to face because he's been ducking me ever since the league was created and that is Matt Beard. All right. Well we'll see what we'll see what we can reward you with. Until then, sir, I'm gonna go ahead and sit you in the back and I will see you next time as I go ahead and bring in your opponent and Again, it, very competitive, very close. You could see it in the way that the judges were making the calls here, man. All it'll take is to just get over that slight hump, get over the win, and you will be on and running. And you're not the only person stuck in that hump. Uh, Dean Lewis this year as well as another competitor so far. Good performances. Just get got to get over that little hump and get the win. How do you walk away feeling, though? I actually feel like like this was my best match so far. And then, you know, like, mm -hmm. I came in prepared. You know, like, in just the calls, you know, I should have, like, brought up, you know, about the – I just, uh, you know, like I was like screwing up in my mind, you know, I knew what I wanted to say it just wasn't coming out right. But, but don't worry, I'm excited to do it next time. And then you're like, mm -hmm. hopefully I'll get my win. You know, I just want to get one win so far, you know, and then we'll and I'll focus on, you know, two or three, you know. Absolutely, man. You got to take it one at a time. Uh, and yeah, again, uh, every I think this year's rookie class has been really, really good. I think no matter whether they've gone on a win streak or just had that tough luck, every single person has stepped in and done really, really well this year. Uh, of, and you're no exception to that, man. 0-3, it's a tough record to have, but you are getting better each time. The performances are getting there, and all it takes is that one game where it clicks and you finally get on your way. Uh, and let's hope that that does come in, in the event that, like I said before, this is, for the most part, we're wrapping up this season. In the event it is your last match for the year, let's see how it shakes out next year. With that said, sir, congratulations on your debut season. Yep. We will see you next time as we'll go ahead and sit you in the back. And we will wrap this up, guys. Malcolm finally getting that second long-awaited win. A really good performance from him tonight. A good performance from Ross as well. Uh, just, again, I mean, tons of people who have played this game have felt that. I mean, hell, we have someone like Madi who just picked up his first win in the tournament last Friday. He is not over that. You know, he had to get over that hump, and it took him a long time to get over it to start picking up wins. Sometimes it just takes a bit to get there to finally find that streak within you. Uh, and Ross has certainly shown he has the potential, so we'll see how it shakes out next year, though. With that said, thank you, everybody, for tuning in tonight. Of course, we have more matches coming up this week, including the second matchup of round one of the tournament coming this weekend. So be sure to tune in for that. Thank you to my judges who are here tonight, Jake, Allen, and Nick. Thank you to Malcolm and Ross again for a great game. And on behalf of everyone at the Movie Battleground, my name is Aaron Canole. We'll see you next time. Take care, everybody. <laughs>